Well, in this video, we're going to do something we haven't done in a while, and that's stabilize. Uh, you may or may not remember these. This is spalted maple, and it is very rotten. And this is from one of the processing videos that I did uh, when I basically processed wood from raw logs to bowl blanks. And um, this maple just had some incredible spalting in it, so you know, I just couldn't throw those out. They've been through my fridge kiln. They're nice and dry. So I know this, I know the bucket that we're going to use for this and I don't see the point in stabilizing all of this if you're going to trim it away and, you know, throw away. So what I'm going to do is round these first so that they fit into my casting bucket that I'm going to use. And um, I don't know, it's it should be something cool. We're going to do something between the two of them. Haven't figured that out yet. Uh, but I got a couple of ideas. But uh, anyway, that's going to be this uh, this week's project. So let's get these rounded on the bandsaw and uh, we'll go from there. I do have a couple of templates. Um, so that will work. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the pith. Can't really keep it centered here. But for this one, I'll be able to put this on the pith and cut it out and we'll have a little resin pocket on one side. For this one, well, it's not going to be a whole lot. I'll probably have to attach that and then round it this way. So this will show you how uh, stabilizing resin can really make a really beautiful project like this one. And uh, the thing is with stabilizing resin, it certainly is not cheap. So that's why, you know, I, I was saying that, you know, trim your pieces that you intend on stabilizing because if you're going to cut it away, then there's really no point in, in doing it at all, to be quite honest with you. But once we get these cut up, we'll be able to get them stabilized. Uh, this, these two pieces were just way too nice to not do something with, even though they were incredibly rotten and punky. Uh, but that's what the stabilizing resin is for. Going to be using cactus juice stabilizing resin. Uh, the only knock on this resin and other stabilizing resins that I've used in the past is that they are not food safe once fully cured. So if you're intending on making a project that you want food safe, then it's probably best to not use stabilizing resin. An option would be to use deep cast with its long open time and its thin consistency. When that goes into the pressure pot, or you can put it in the vacuum chamber as well. Uh, even though it's not meant to be a stabilizing resin, it certainly does do a really good job of it. The only thing with the stabilizing resin is that it's, you know, it's water thin and it stays that way until it's heat cured. But um, the deep cast is certainly an option as well for food safe stuff. You're going to see a ton of air come out of this. Uh, I wasn't able to get Dwayne on this. Dwayne's the bigger rock that I use and because it was too tall and it was hitting on the glass. So again, you know, just amazed at how much air comes out of this, but you want that air to come out and be replaced with a stabilizing resin. The goal here is to get these pieces of wood not to float. <laughs> and then uh, that way you know that they're for the most part saturated. Anyway, I'm going to let this run for about probably another 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll bring it back and we'll have a look at it. Well, it's actually been a half hour, eh, probably more like 20 minutes, I guess. Uh, as you can see, there's still quite a bit coming out of it. Uh, I'm able to pull full vacuum and I have for that good 20 minutes. I uh, So, you know, normally you're supposed to let this go until you stop seeing bubbles so you pull a vacuum until you stop seeing bubbles but I don't really know if that's going to happen in the next few hours here and then we're at the end of the day so what I'm going to do is release the vacuum and leave this submerged and you know if you vacuum this for an hour uh, the instructions say you're supposed to let it sit for two hours so what I'm going to do is release the vacuum let it sit overnight 
And then tomorrow, we'll be able to throw it into the oven and cure it up. There's a lot of fluid there. I think we'll be okay. So, of course, overnight, this will absorb. Actually, I can take this off now. That way, we can see better. Overnight, this will absorb that resin, and I'm sure that resin level will drop off. I did have to stop halfway through and fill this up because uh, it had, the wood had absorbed so much of it that it was actually below the surface of the wood. So if you're going to do this, you got to make sure that the wood is always submerged in the resin or else it's not going to work. Uh, all right, well, we'll see you tomorrow, same time, and we'll cook these up and uh, see how we make out with that. Well, how are you doing this morning? Well, actually, I guess it's uh, it's new. <laughs> so uh, this is about 20 hours after I shut it off. Uh, it has definitely absorbed some more of the fluid, but you know, I don't think it's absorbed that much. We'll know when we pull these rocks off, if these float, if uh, we've been successful or not. So there, that's exactly what you want to see. You don't want to see that wood float because if it does, then it still means it's got a lot of air inside of it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take these pieces out and let them drip dry in another bucket. And then we'll throw them in the toaster oven. Oh yeah. Holy. Oh man, I can't, I forgot to measure the weight on these. Uh, this is unbelievable how heavy this is. Crazy. I would say this is easily four times its weight. Maybe even more than that when it first went in. <laughs> Crazy. Looks like I'm going to have to get some more cactus juice. Alright, so I'll let them, I don't know, drip for about a half hour or so. Then we'll throw them in the uh, toaster oven. The other thing that I should have done is I should have measured the fluid level before I took it out. But I would say that of all of the stabilizing resin we put in, Easily half of it has gone into these two pieces. See you in a bit. All right, so that's been a half hour or so. Uh, now, it's a common practice to wrap these in tin foil. The problem with that, when you put them in the oven, there all this will leach out and it will form solid barriers on stuff. And I don't like that at all. And I think most people don't either. So I'll show you when we get over to the toaster oven, but I've put some um, aluminum foil over top of the burners so that when the stabilizing resin drips out and lands on top of them that it doesn't land right on the burners. It's probably going to smoke really, really bad. <laughs> but um, anyway, we'll, uh, let's do our first piece and see how we make out. Anyway, there's the tin foil down in the bottom of this. Well, that's it. Um, I can only do 60 minutes, so I'm going to bake, and it is set at 250. We'll, uh, when the smoke starts rolling, <laughs> I'll bring it back because I'm sure there will be lots of it. Got a little bit of a breeze today, but um, not strong enough, so hopefully the shop doesn't fill up with uh, smoke. All right, we're coming near to the end of our first hour, and surprisingly enough, it isn't smoking as bad as I thought it would. I don't know if you can see that dripping out of there. It definitely is smoking, though. Uh, I bumped the temperature up to uh, 300 on this because I don't think that this was really doing a whole lot. So anyway, uh, you can see the material dripping out of here. And of course, if that uh, aluminum foil wasn't there, well, it'd be all over the all over the burners and it would be really really smoking so anyway when it finishes here I'll put it on for another hour 
Uh, I might do like two and a half hours at 300. And then that way it's going to be, we're going to know for sure that this is, all that resin is cured inside here. And we definitely need that because it's going to be a problem when we go to recast these pieces if it isn't. So anyway, I'll bring it back in another hour after the next cycle and we'll have a look at it then. All right, that just shut off. So that is uh, two hours at, well, it's 300 on here, but it's probably more like around 250. Uh, let's get this out and look at it. I think I need to put it in for another half hour or so. When this stuff is in this state, it's actually quite easy to skate, uh, scrape off. So I'm going to do that. Here's the bottom side. It actually looks really, really clean. I don't know if the camera can see inside of there or not. So all of that material that you see in there, if you had to wrap that in the aluminum foil, that would be all stuck to the, uh, to the piece. So that's a reason why you don't wrap your pieces in aluminum foil. Another 30 minutes and we'll be done with that one anyway. Here's the larger one going in. Okay, this just shut off. Uh, this was losing so much resin, so when it gets hot, the resin's gonna run. And it actually pooled underneath this, so I had to take a t-shirt and stick it underneath of this to soak up all that resin. Uh, anyway, that's been two hours. Uh, it's the end of the day, and I don't wanna stay out here for another two hours. But I'm gonna run that for another two hours again tomorrow, or sorry, an hour anyway and then an hour for the other one, maybe a half hour, it's not as thick. The thicker it is, I mean, I'm worried about the core temperature inside of this thing, making sure that all of that stabilizing resin is cured and that it's not still in its liquid state because that will be no good when we go to recast this. Anyway, that's it for me. It's the end of the day. See you tomorrow. So before we cast these pieces, I wanna run them through the drum sander just to clean off both of the flat surfaces and make them parallel to each other. And um, after that, and uh, yeah, that's just a really cool look, that spalted maple, you just can't go wrong with that. And then we'll take these over to the lathe and use a brass brush to clean off all of the residue that's on the side. I just really want to give everything a good tooth for the casting resin to stick to, uh, just to make sure that there's no adhesive adhesion issues. One of the biggest questions I get asked is what can you do with the leftover shavings? So we've got green here, some orange, and purple. And um, <laughs> I've seen examples of this on YouTube and if the resin shavings have any pieces of wood in them, when the piece is done, it kind of looks dirty to me. You'll see little wood bits through it. and It's just not me. It's not the look that I like. And I, as I see a piece of wood. <laughs> and anyway, we're going to combine these together along with a very light tinted epoxy, which I'm not exactly sure what that's going to be yet. Uh, we haven't done orange in a while, but I don't know, maybe green, purple. They'll, they'll all really go with this. So, you know, hopefully this will satisfy people's uh, request as to wanting to see me do something with these and what can be made with them. So you're going to see me pack these in here in clumps, and that's kind of what I was going for. I, I didn't want them to all mix together. I want it. Uh, essentially color separation and that's how you certainly can do it with these shavings but you know I know that they're going to compress so I'm packing them in as tight as I can. I think that these are predominantly white but there's all kinds of different colors throughout them too. There I want to leave a little reservoir up here because we're going to have to put some resin in here. 
Uh, okay, let's figure out what we're going to do for the uh, epoxy. I didn't show it to the camera, but we are in fact using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. And along with that, we're going to be using Flash Wine Red. And there may be some ask why I decided to use that. And I can't tell you why, because I don't know. I just like the look of it, and I thought it would go good in the casting. But as you see, I didn't put a whole lot in this, and that makes it very translucent. All right, I'm going to assume that this is probably the first of two of these buckets. Yep. Bring it back when I'm uh, done the second one. Right, I mixed the paddle mixer. I mixed this with the paddle mixer so it's got more air in it than the previous batch. Now is that because it's floating? Not really. Well, I guess it's going to need another one. All right, hopefully this is the last one. I didn't think that we were going to worry about any thermal cracking with this piece, but we, we keep going here. We just might. I didn't think it was going to use this much epoxy. I guess I am going to have to throw a rock on this. I didn't think that uh, this would float, but here they will. Vacuum chamber next. Here we go. There's probably a lot of people wondering why that top piece was floating. And I believe that's because the resin shavings that are underneath of it have a lot of air in them. So of course, when you add the fluid to it, then of course it's gonna to wanna to make the piece float. So I'm pretty much 100% sure that that's the reason why the top piece was floating. It wasn't the fact that it wasn't stabilized enough because trust me, it certainly was. So we're going to watch this cycle on and off and uh, again all that air you've got to get that out of these shavings and i really the examples that i've seen here on youtube that haven't where the vacuum chamber wasn't used i uh, certainly did not yield all that great results the videos that i've seen anyway so the combination of the vacuum chamber and the pressure pot should really take all of the air out of this piece and spoiler alert it does so that's how you can do these uh these castings successfully without actually having a lot of air bubbles incorporated in the in the resin while i've never tried this it was a suggested that to put a stick across the casting and that way it'll prevent the resin from foaming over and that may be successful if I could get it straight across a piece and not just on the back side of it. As it was sitting there, it didn't help at all. It just boiled right over the edge. But if it was over the center, maybe a different story. Well, that's full vacuum. Still lots of air coming out. Uh, this has been about 45 minutes now. So, you know, I'm just going to release the vacuum and get this in the pressure pot. Uh, anyway, you might find it interesting to see how far this <laughs> resin level drops off when the vacuum is released. Anyway, I'm just going to get this out and put it in the pressure pot. We'll see you in there in three days. Hopefully uh, it doesn't crack, but hey, if it does, we know how to fix that too. Okay, so <laughs> as you can see, the casting is out of the bucket. Um, Yesterday, when I was getting this out of the bucket, uh, I thought my microphone was working. Uh, the battery was fine, but it um, the microphone died. Anyway, this is where we are, and um, I'm a little disappointed. This piece is nice and flat in the bucket, and when I was placing this in on top of those shavings, I thought that it was going to be good too. I didn't think that there was, you know, I knew that it wasn't going to be perfectly set, 
but I didn't think that it was going to be out almost a half an inch. So from here to here and well to here, it's almost out a half an inch and that is just playing havoc with me and I, I can't have it. So there is a lot of leftover resin on the top. Um, just goes to show you what stabilizing will do. I thought that it was going to use up a lot of this, but I guess uh, having this piece in the vacuum chamber really, really did its job. So what's the plan now? Well, I think what I'm going to do is mount this on the lathe and I'm going to cut to try and part through this at its smallest opening right here and straight through the piece as much as I can and then uh, essentially mount this on the lathe somehow, straighten this edge and then I'll have two hard edges that I can put together that I know will be even. And I know that for some of you, you may be looking, oh, that's just crazy to do that. But you know, when this is, my intention with this is a hollow form of some sort. And with this band being way off the way it is, it's just going to look terrible. And you know, we've been down this road before and um, I don't want to go there again. <laughs> that's all there is to it. So anyway, that's where we are. Uh, nothing but pain and anguish and disappointment. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's life anyway. So along with um, the piece of wood on the top moving like this, what happened was the piece of wood got drove further down into the bucket and it made it oblong here. So we'll get rid of that. That's not really so much of a big deal because, you know, if this was sitting flat and, and, and up tighter or up near the top of the bucket, we wouldn't have this. Um, some of you may be questioning why I didn't put a physical spacer between these two pieces of wood. And the reason for that is I knew that these shavings were going to shrink, but I didn't think they were going to shrink down that far. And so if you put a spacer in there and then try and pack it as tight as you can around with the, with the resin shavings and then put it in the bucket, when you go to um, do the vacuuming on it, you're going to end up with, you know, a, basically a clear spot of resin, this color in between the two of them. And I, just didn't want that. At least that's the way that in my mind, how I thought it would go. So that was another reason why I didn't do that. Uh, Cause I know there's gonna be some comments about that. Anyway, let's get some centers and get this on the lathe and try and fix this. That's probably about as good as we're going to get. So, all right, on to uh, rescuing this piece. Uh, I'm using the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. And um, like I said, I'm not going to totally get this thing true. I don't see the, the need for it just to take that big kind of wonky side out. And then when we part this piece in half, my, I want to save as much of that resin band that I can. So we're going to sacrifice some of this spalted maple in order to get that done. The main focus of this video was the resin banding. So that's why I went in that direction as opposed to saving more, uh, more of that spalted maple. Uh, the reason that I cleaned up there is so that I can pick up these resin shavings and then reuse them down the road in another project maybe similar to this so that's why i cleaned up and yes it's um <laughs> resin turning epoxy turning wood turning in general is a very very messy uh art form <laughs> there's no doubt about that So anyway, when we get this, I, I didn't see the point of recasting this with this on the top. So that's why I'm taking it off now. 
and then that wood will be able to flatten essentially the the top piece of wood and the resin banding and then we'll be able to uh, pour some more epoxy and get them get them sorted out and look the way that they should have So that is a 3 16 inch parting tool from Crown. I might have tried the thinner one, but the thing is, I find that you don't have much mechanical advantage when using the thinner parting tool. So this one's got a substantial handle on it, so that's why I decided to use, um, use this. And it is freshly sharpened. And last week I used a handsaw, and I'm like, you know, I, I'm not the smartest or the sharpest tool in the shed uh, I've got a sawzall why not use that so I used that this week and I was like man that's that's a lot easier so uh, it's just, you know it's just things that you don't think of or maybe you didn't think were going to be that difficult but the sawzall that's the answer So now I have the lower half mounted between centers. Uh, the goal here is to just expose resin all the way around on the top. Some people might have been fine with leaving a little bit of wood in there. Uh, my brain wouldn't let me do that. So that's kind of <laughs> why it just didn't look right to me. So that's why I decided to do that. And um, I, th I just thought it was important to get rid of all of that wood and, and essentially make a a window inside of the hollow form if you're if you're following and having little wood chunks in there just wasn't doing it for me the one thing that i did do was make sure to sand with 60 grit that way the resin has a good bonding surface to bond to and both pieces where they come together are just slightly concave that way there's no gaps uh, after the casting gets cast again. Okay, well, at least it's not a complete loss. We'll reuse these at a later date in another casting similar to this, but correctly. Anyway, let's get some resin mixed up. Stick these two pieces back together and fill in any little voids that we've got. We're going to use some art cast. The Pro Series would have worked here as well. Uh, I like using art cast because it's really super clear. And um, But the Pro Series would have been a good fit here too. Okay, um, I'm going to throw this in the pressure pot. I will throw a weight on this just to make sure that it doesn't move. And we'll see you tomorrow and we'll just pretend that this never happened. See you tomorrow. All right, it is the next day. Let's get Dwayne off and see what's going on with the casting. Hopefully it's all good. Yes, I could have used mold release. I forgot. Yeah, that wasn't so bad after all. Gap looks good. Still got a center. So that, that goes to show you that, you know, to elevate the buckets, if you do another recast like I just did, this is totally dry. None of that epoxy went down inside of here on the base because there's my original mark and it's there's no new epoxy. Uh, I thought that it was going to, so that's why there's so much on the top and that's why I gave it that much, just in case that happened. But that goes to show you that, you know, just put a little spacer on the bottom of that bucket would have allowed that epoxy to flow down and fill us in, but it really wasn't needed. Get a center on here and we'll get on the leaf.
So at the 30 minute mark ish, we're uh, finally going to complete this piece or attempt to anyway. I know that a lot of people like for me to leave this content in here. Uh, I could have cut a ton of footage out of here and not shown basically the rescue of this piece. And I never really thought that this was going to be a thing on my channel, but it seems to be a lot of people really like me leaving in errors like this so that they can see how I fix them. So if it ever happens to them in the future, they have a reference. So, you know, I, and I also think that it's important to leave this in here. My analytics tell me the other thing that these videos being as long as they are in all likelihood probably hurt me. But uh, in the end, I'm going to leave this kind of content in here so that we can all learn from it. And, you know, if people don't like it, then just fast forward through the through the video. And um, but anyway, I by all means, leave your comment down below. But I, I think that it's important to leave this kind of content in here so that we can all learn together. All right, so for the last 15 minutes or so, I've been trying to work on this form and figure out exactly what I want to do and something different, and this is what I come up with. Hopefully you can see that. I've only got it drawn on one side, but this would certainly be something that I don't think we've done before. Um, trying to go for something different, but uh, unfortunately it looks like we're gonna lose a lot of this on the top here. The opening will probably be something like this, I think. So, you know, <laughs> there's not really much I can do about it. Uh, there'll be lots of spalting on the very bottom piece. I could do this a flat top, but again, this is something that, you know, we've done quite a bit, so I wanna try and change it up. But um, unfortunately, we're gonna lose a lot of that spalting. Other thing is, I'm getting a lot of questions about this. This is the power cap, active IP, and that is from JSP. Uh, again, you know, I, I do plan on doing a review on this and that is coming, so please be patient with that. But anyway, I've been getting a lot of requests as to what it is I'm wearing and that's what it is. All right, uh, let's get at this. I mean, this is all subject to change. <laughs> if you've been here long enough, you'll know that uh, that's just the way that, uh, that I work here. One of the things that was important to me with this band is to make sure that this part is on an angle so that when you look down on the piece, it's gonna be a lot wider, say like this, as opposed to being straight down through it. So that's another consideration as far as making this like this. And yeah, I could come out and do just, there's all kinds of different forms you could do with this, but I wanna do something different. So uh, anyway, that's enough yakking, let's start doing. And no doubt there are some people in the crowd here that do not really know what spalting refers to. But uh, spalting, spalted wood is essentially wood that's starting to decay and it has a naturally occurring fungi growing in it. And you can get many different colors of spalting. I've seen greens, purples, uh, I haven't seen blue certainly seen some red, orange, and pencil line spalting, which is predominant, is dominant in this piece, is basically, if you, it looks like I drew on the piece with a pencil. That's why it's called pencil line spalting. And it's really neat, I, you know, I, I'm certainly no expert in, in any means on this, but Essentially, that pencil line spalting occurs when fungi get in there and they seal off an area from compete, other competing fungi within the wood. And then you get these spalted areas and that's how you get your different colors. Uh, again, take that all with a grain of salt. But essentially, in the area that we live in, if I take a log and throw it on the ground and leave it there for a year to two years in length, 
the log, especially if it's maple or birch, is going to have a lot of spalting in it as well. And I used to do that. I would buy a lot of logs and just leave them sit for over a year just to get some color in them to give them some visual interest. So if you have the if you have the, the ability and the means to get your hands on a lot of logs and just leave them sitting around, then you might find some very interesting pieces will come out of it. Another species that has a very common fungus in it is box elder or Manitoba maple in, in Canada. That's what it's referred to as here. Pretty much the rest of the world, I think, refers to it as box elder. But box elder has a naturally occurring fungus in it that's red and it sends it to stressed parts of the tree so you're going to see a lot of it in burls and around knots and any place that the tree has been stressed in the past and of course you know having these logs sitting around for as long as they are you you do run the risk of basically the bugs getting to them before you do which really is not desirable i i, I don't mind bug infested wood as long as it's completely full of holes and you can say fill it with resin but in the past prior to doing any resin or epoxy work i you know unfortunately it was firewood it's just too much effort to to try and save these pieces before you know resin and epoxy came into my life here so you know it it's it's something that can you can make some really unique pieces with but um getting it processed before the bugs get into it and destroy it is is one of the big battles <laughs> and knowing when to process it and when to not process it will come with time uh the other big important thing is if you're going to spalt your logs make sure that they're in the shade and not sitting in the sun and leave the bark on so there's basically the rough form again this form really showcases all of that spalted maple and the resin band. The resin band, because it's cut on an angle, is now wider in appearance. And uh, I'm really digging this shape. But let me know in the comments what you think. Like I usually do, I'm going to throw a glue block on the bottom of this. So that means I got to get a tenon turned in the very opening here at the top. Uh, problem is I was I couldn't really get the parting tool to go in straight because the jaw profile on the Stronghold trucks is actually a straight profile. Uh, the two that I have anyway. So you'll see me take the, the jaws off of the one way Stronghold chuck and kind of put them in there to see how they're fitting and I keep working away at it until I figure that I've got a large enough tenon yeah those are the jaws that come on the stronghold chucks from one way and anyway this is one way to check to see if your tenon is going to work or your mortise if you want to use a mortise and yes I could have used a mortise but you know <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of those as we all know so just going to reverse this piece that way I can clean off the bottom and then we'll be able to get a glue block on the bottom of this and uh, reverse it yet again. Since the tenon that's holding this piece wasn't really the greatest, I figured that I would just grind off the excess epoxy that was on the bottom of this and as opposed to trying to tool it off and it was sent 60 grit and there is your waste block that's been dumped or dipped in hot melt glue and I keep uh, another common question is people asking me where do I get the hot melt glue that I use and unfortunately if you don't live in Canada you're not gonna be able to get it because I get it from Canadian Tire but I think that any hot melt glue will work. I don't see the differences in hot melt glue. I might be wrong in that regard. I've used a lot of different types over the years. They all seem to perform the same to me.
Well, what do you think about her shape? I don't know what is going on here. Uh, it's I can't get a good clean cut on it. I, I don't know if it's it's weird. I've never kind of dealt with this, and I know this is the shavings that are doing this. One of the reasons why I haven't really done this. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we'll see what we can do with that. The spalting from the side is just absolutely amazing. Totally gorgeous. And again, down here at the base of this, really cool too. Uh, this ghosting here, it's going to have to stay. I mean, if I get rid of all this ghosting we see here, then it's going to be considerably smaller. There's another one there. And in a way, it's nice because they tie this into this. All right, we're going to get the steady rest set up. And um, I'll talk to you when we get ready to do some hauling here. All right, we are all set up and ready for hollowing. This is the one-way hollowing system. If you haven't seen it before, the captive system. And uh, I've got my modified laser set up. And teardrop cutter. Right now it's set at about that, whatever that is. <laughs> I won't be doing too much more of this today, but uh, we'll get started on this. Let's get her done. So here I am at the very top of the vessel. Uh, I don't know why I decided to do this. I should have just picked up the Hercules and trimmed up the very top part of this. But you'll see what's going to happen when you come around the edge here. Yeah, I was lucky that this piece was destroyed. That's some pretty massive chip out. And... <laughs> Anyway, after it happened, I'm like, like, what am I doing? These tools are not designed for that. Scrapers, which essentially, that's what all these cutters are for the one-way system, are meant to be used inside the form and then pulled out while keeping contact with the side of the wood. And if I had it done that, that way, that catch never would have happened. But going the other direction with this cutter, I just about destroyed this piece. You know, and again, I could have cut this out of here, but I think it's all important that that I show this so that we all learn. I will say that this this here is the next day, and that was the end of the day, and I was getting tired. And, you know, when you get tired, bad things can happen. So if you're tired, you should not be, should not be on the lathe. I realize that sometimes we have no choice. But um, anyway, that was a lesson, and... I'm glad that it didn't destroy this piece because I really like it. I was finding the rig was a little sticky, so I'm going to get some glide coat here and spray it on all of the surfaces, uh, the metal surfaces that are going to contact each other. And it's more or less a spray on wax that doesn't leave a residue behind so it doesn't get transferred to other wood pieces that you're using because that can be an issue as well and then after that was on then this thing was just nice and smooth and that's exactly what you want with these captive systems because what can happen is you'll be fighting with the rig a little bit and then all of a sudden the cutter will kind of slam into the side of the wood and then there you've got a really bad catch so if you're having issues like that, I highly recommend the glide coat. It works great. Nice and smooth, just the way you want. And that's one of the keys to getting the inside of the form really nice and smooth as well. If you're always fighting the rig, then it's unlikely that you're going to have a nice smooth surface on the inside of the, uh, of the hollow form. Here I'm just installing the little extension that comes with this boring bar. It uh, 
really is helpful in these situations and I didn't have to change out to the smaller boring bars I was able to stay with a large boring bar and of course I like using this one because you get less vibration with it it's just so robust but the one thing that I forgot to do uh, was raise the tool rest slightly I do eventually remember to do that later on here Anyway, I've cut a ton of this footage out. Um, there's not really a whole lot that, that can be seen here. This is how I sharpen the teardrop cutter. I just pulled it off the rig when I first got it, set it, set my tool rest to the same profile as what came on the cutter. And it's very simple to um, sharpen it. This is a shot of the laser doing its job on the outside of the vessel and if you're not familiar with these systems the way it works is essentially when the laser falls off the side of the form when it gets elongated then you've achieved the wall thickness that you've set with the rig. Uh, it's a very simple user friendly system uh, especially with the modifications that I've made to it and um, I've been debating on cutting out the top part of the steady rest and the only real issue that I have with that I think that it's going to be structurally strong enough and here's a good look at it but I think that I have to change the location of the wheels put them more um, towards the floor if you will and then that way uh, the laser hopefully would be seen on the whole form or the vast majority of it while doing this. It's, it is robust and I think that I can do it. Uh, I might try it and if it moves around too much then I can always weld the piece back on. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm always trying to improve things. And look, there's the Hercules and that's what I should have done from the start. I did find that after having the catch that there in one area right there, there was some pretty big chip out, but I was able to turn that away and no harm, no foul, lucky for me. Well, before we start sanding, I thought I'd show you the inside here. It's not too bad actually cut pretty clean little divot down there at the very base that I can't get rid of if I can get that shine there I don't want to really dig into that too far because uh, could end up going through the bottom of this so it's gonna to have to stay I think I'm gonna do a resin coat on the inside of this anyway so it doesn't really matter that'll get filled in and you won't even see it all right send it next If you haven't seen this before, that is an extension that you can buy and you can get them at any wood turning uh, place that sells wood turning supplies really. This one actually came from Princess Auto here in, in Canada. And um, the little copper pipe that's on there allows you to hold it and steady it and not get your hands hot and that was su suggested in the comments a little while back. Uh, I just put the piece of sandpaper between my fingers just enough to reach in there as far as I can and the piece was sanded to 220 on the inside. Now we haven't, with all the sanding and the steady rest, it's caused this piece to move a little bit. So I just need to take some little finishing cuts. You'll also see me use some CA glue on that resin area. That tear out or the little chip out that I was getting I just could not stop it even with fresh cutters and you know for the life of me I'm not exactly sure what it is possibly um, ghost pigment maybe but uh, it's weird it just wasn't turning like the rest of the uh, the epoxy that was in this piece so go figure to sort out the issues with the areas that I'm having the problems with we're going to use some of this thin CA from Starbond and again there's a link in the description to get 15% off your next order 
there was a small little crack that I filled in on the very upper part of where the, the opening is. And that is the Phoenix that you're seeing me use. Again, these are all from Hunter Tools. And I put a brand new cutter on it. And the combination of the new cutter and the, the thin ZA glue, I was finally able to cut it clean or clean enough um, so that we could sand this out. As far as the sanding on the outside, again, these are the three and a half inch double discs from sandpaper.ca. And I only sanded this piece from 60 to 320 on the outside. And the reason for that is because I still plan on doing a resin coat on the inside. And I didn't want to run the risk of sanding this to 800 only to get a resin run and have to redo it all. So after taking almost a full day to stabilize those piece, two pieces of wood, I figured that it was best that I upgraded my toaster oven <laughs> game here. So this is a much larger toaster oven. And great thing about that is it's got a tray. So all of the stuff will drip onto the tray and knock it on the elements. Uh, and it's also, you can fit something that's 12 inches deep inside of it. So uh, just after stabilizing, and it literally took all day for me to do that, that, you know, now I can put a lot more pieces in there and do it all in one shot as opposed to <laughs> doing it all day. It's even a rotisserie. I just got done mixing up some Pro Series and that's what we're going to throw on the inside of this. Six ounces of it. There, I'll leave that like that for probably about 10 minutes and then uh, I'll flip it over I uh, hit the inside with the torch because there's probably going to be some bubbles in there. But I'm hoping with this stabilized wood being stabilized that uh, we're not going to get any uh, air in it. But I think that we'll probably get some, but I think it's going to be quite limited. All right, we will see you tomorrow when we put the finish on the outside of this piece. And I think it's going to be mighty nice. See you then. So this is the next day and I've just got the 320 just sanding the inside of that, getting it ready for the next coat of finish. It's always important to either rough up the next coat of finish, be it resin or be it water lux, whatever you're going to be using, any finish really. And then it was sanded from 320 to 800 on the outside. That's the Triple E buffing compound from the Be All buffing system. We'll buff this piece out and take all the fine scratches out of it and then we'll use some denatured alcohol to clean the surface of it prior to the first coat of finish going on the outside of this. Well good morning this is the first coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well what do you think of that? Definitely got the color from the resin shavings in there. Uh, the spalting is just incredible. Absolutely amazing. It's actually a part right here that's translucent. You can see right through it. The, uh, the maple on the bottom, well, it ain't bad either. Fantastic stuff. Here's the resin coat on the inside, nice and shiny. Only gonna need the one coat. Beautiful. Due to the length of this video, I didn't show the other coat. This piece was done with two coats. I just used the Triple E buffing compound be, uh, before the next coat of finish went on. And then the denatured alcohol like I do each and every week. And now the piece is mounted on the vacuum chuck and just getting ready to finish up the base. I did decide to do the engraving on the bottom of this. It was so busy that I don't think that it would have 
really showed up very much with um, a pen. All right, well, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. Let's have a last little chat about this beautiful holophone. Well, what do you think about this? I've done a lot of spalt and maple since I've been a wood turner, and this is some of the best. That is for sure. Pencil line spalting, really awesome. Uh, the shavings, the, the packing those shavings in there in clumps like that will definitely give you the color separation if you're going for that. I really actually like it. I like it a lot more than I thought I would. But I think the real big key is, is the using the vacuum chamber and then the pressure pot to get rid of the bubbles in there. That one spot in particular that I was having a real hard time uh, trying to cut cleanly. I don't know exactly what that is. I wasn't using HyperShift at that time, so I'm wondering if it's maybe the ghost pigment. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's a neat project. I should uh, show you the bottom. Decided to use the engraver on this. And as per normal, I'm running out of time and I don't have any finish on the bottom. Size on this piece, I'll put the metric conversion up on the screen, is seven and a half inches across and about six and a half inches tall. And it's anywhere from a quarter to three eighths of an inch in thickness. Uh, there's the inside. It's about a quarter of an inch of thickness on the bottom of this piece. And there's a little, when I, when I turn this back over and let that resin pool there at the bottom, there's a tiny little flat spot in there and I'm fine with that. That'll help to make the bottom that much stronger. And uh, well, if it didn't crack on the engraving, it isn't going to crack. Uh, so this piece is for sale. If you're interested, send me an email to spragwoodturning at gmail.com and I will disclose the price then. A uh, really neat project. Just wish that, you know, it had of gone a little smoother in the beginning <laughs> as, per, as per normal. But uh, the spalted maple is just awesome. Just awesome. All right, I'll set this down. Don't forget to put designer epoxy down in the comments to uh, be entered into their draw at 105,000. And we're, we're actually uh, at over 104, so it won't be too long. And of course, don't forget about the promotion that they have on my channel right now. If you use code inlay, uh, inlay gym at checkout, you receive five free color bags, free shipping within continental USA and Canada, and 10% off your order. Uh, all they ask is that you spend 100 bucks with them. And along with that, don't forget about my other sponsors in the description down below. If you need some stuff, go down there and uh, put some money back in your pocket. What else? I think that's it. Next week, we've got a... Well, hopefully we've got, because I'm still in the process of, of doing it, hopefully we've got... A, um, another vase project coming up that's going to be flag themed of some sort. So, um, but anyway, we'll cross that bridge when we get there and it's still in the development stages. So hopefully everything goes all right with that. Uh, a lot smoother than this one anyway. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. That is the largest way for me to build my presence here on YouTube. And just remember that you guys are absolutely awesome and we'll see you next week. Take care.